Hello. In this video, I want to introduce you to a second method for analyzing the molecular dynamics simulations that you perform. In the method I want to introduce you to here, we are interrogating the dynamic properties of the materials. In other words, we are investigating how the velocities of the particles change. In the video, I'm going to explain how we can investigate these velocities by computing the velocity also correlation function and what information we can extract by investigating this function. On the previous slide, I explained that in this video, we are learning to analyze the dynamic properties of materials. Let's begin by unpacking that aim for a moment and quickly recapping the tools that we have learned for probing static properties. These static properties are things like free energy surfaces, response functions, ensemble averages, and the radial distribution functions that you computed in the first assignments. In the first assignment where you used ASE, you learned how these static properties can be used to distinguish between materials in their solid, liquid, and gaseous states. For the radial distribution functions that are shown on this slide in particular, you saw how the transition from solid to liquid and to gas is accompanied by a loss in structure in the radial distribution function. The radial distribution function, blue line, for a solid has many sharp peaks, as you can see here. When the system transitions to the liquid state, black line, these peaks get smaller and broader. In the gas, red, the peaks are almost entirely absent and the radial distribution function is pretty much flat. These changes in the radial distribution function between the various states of matter reflect the different natures of solids, liquids and gases that you probably learned about when you first started secondary school. As you learned all those years ago, the atoms in a solid are arranged in a regular and repeating pattern. They pretty much stay tied to these lattice sites and only fluctuate around them a little. When the system transitions to the liquid state, the atoms have a little bit more freedom to move. They're still packed closely together, however, and are constrained by their neighbours as a result. Finally, when the system transitions to the gaseous state here, each atom is free to move about independently of its neighbours, as shown in this diagram. What I'm trying to say here is that the radial distribution function that you've learned about now in the final year of your degree is basically, and the differences between the radial distribution functions you see in different phases of matter, is a manifestation of the differences between the structures of solids, liquids and gases that you should have learned about when you were 11. Let's now return to the subject matter of this video and the calculation of the velocity autocorrelation function. The autocorrelation function is the first example we have come across of a dynamic property of the material. Everything that we have calculated in this module thus far has been a static property. Given this, it is perhaps worth getting into the details of this difference between static and dynamic properties before spending too much time talking about the velocity correlation function itself. These terms, static and dynamic, perhaps seem confusing as we are running molecular dynamics simulations. The word dynamics implies that there is motion going on, so it perhaps seems strange to talk about extracting static properties from these simulations. After all, nothing in our molecular dynamics simulations is static. The atoms are moving about all the time of the system, and the microscopic state of the system is constantly changing. The fact that it is the microscopic state that is changing is critical, however. What we are seeking to probe is not the microscopic structures that the system is, adop is adopting. What we want to extract is the properties of the macroscopic states, the values that we would get if we were to do an experiment. This macroscopic state is what we extract from our simulation whenever we compute an average. The fact that the averages are not time dependent is a consequence of all that we have learned about statistical mechanics. It is a consequence of the fact that the probability of being in each microstates is given by this expression. 
Notice that the probability of being in a particular microstate is not time dependent. In other words, the probability of adopting each of the states is a static property of the system that does not depend on time. It is this distribution that we are probing whenever we compute a static property. Basically, we are invoking the fact that there is a static distribution that tells us the probability of being in each of the microstates when we compute static properties. To summarize then, static properties are basically averages, which are themselves properties of the static distribution that tells us how likely we are to be in microstates. Dynamic properties, by contrast, tells us how much the state of the system will change over a short period of time. To calculate a dynamic property, we thus need to calculate one or more properties of the system at two instances in time, as I have indicated with the black circles here. These circles are labelled T and T plus delta to indicate that we have taken two measurements at a time in interval um, delta apart. If we are to compute a dynamic property, we cannot do this once, however, as we always need to average over pairs of properties separated by the same time interval. Dynamic properties are therefore averages that tell us how much correlation there is between properties evaluated at different instances in time. To understand why we might be interested in dynamic properties, let's ask a question. Namely, how do we recognise whether or not atoms are just vibrating around their lattice sites as we would expect them to do in a solid? In other words, how do we recognise if the atoms in a material are collectively vibrating along some mode or, or not? Let's clarify this question by showing what a single atom would be doing if it were vibrating along some fixed mode. The blue atom here is vibrating along a mode. You can see that this atom is just moving back and forth along some fixed direction in space. The red atom here, by contrast, is not vibrating. The direction it is moving along keeps changing. It is thus not vibrating along some fixed mode. We can probe whether or not the atom is still moving along the same direction at some initial time and some later time t plus delta by computing the dot product between the velocity of the atom at time t and the um, velocity of the atom at time t plus delta, as shown here. For the non-vibrating atom, we would expect this dot product to be close to zero as the direction in which the atom is moving at time t is different from the direction of the velocity at time t plus delta, as shown in this diagram. For the blue atom, by contrast, that is vibrating, we would expect this dot product to be non-zero. In this case, the velocity at time t and the velocity at the later time, t plus delta, are parallel or anti-parallel, as shown in the figure. The dot product between these two velocities is thus large, while the magnitude of it is large. This simple idea of calculating the average of the dot product of the velocities at times separated by a time lag of delta that I've explained on this slide is the basic idea we use when we compute the velocity autocorrelation function. We can use this autocorrelation function to answer the question that I posed at the start of the slide. Namely, are the atoms vibrating around their lattice sites as we would expect them to do if the material was in the solid state? Without further ado then, let's discuss how would you would write a program in Python to compute the velocity autocorrelation function. The full Python code you would need to do this is shown here. This function starts by defining a variable called ncore. When we set this variable, we choose the range of delta values for which we are going to compute the autocorrelation function. You can see this at the end of the program in the part of the code that plots 
the autocorrelation function. The times variable that is used to set the x coordinates of the data points that are plotted has n core elements. The 0 0.05, 0, 0, 0.005 in this line that uses np lin space is the time between the frames that were output in the trajectory that I'm analyzing. This times array thus contains the values of delta at which I have evaluated the autocorrelation function. Notice that the variable n core is also used here when I create the arrays that will ultimately hold the autocorrelation function. In this code, I am at thus estimating the autocorrelation function for 50 distinct time intervals. In other words, I am calculating 50 of the average dot products that I introduced on the large slide. If we now turn to the main part of the code, we see that there is a loop over the trajectory frames here. In books that describe this process of calculating an autocorrelation function, this loop is sometimes described as the loop over time origins. Notice furthermore that the variable n is basically a loop index for this outer loop. This variable will be 0 when we are looking at the first frame in the trajectory, 1 when we are looking at the second, and so on. Inside this loop over the trajectory, we have a second loop. This second loop is where we calculate our dot products. The number of times we iterate through this loop is given by this variable max n, which is calculated on the line above the start of the for loop. For the vast majority of the frames that we will analyze, max n is set in such a way that we iterate over the max n frames in the trajectory that include or come after frame n. If the time origin is the nth frame in this trajectory, this inner loop will thus iterate over the nth frame, the n plus 1 frame, the nth plus 2 frame, and so on, up to the n plus max n minus 1th frame. We cannot always iterate over these max n frames, however. If our time origin is near the end of the trajectory, there may not be max n frames after that we are current after the one that we are currently on to iterate over. In these cases, we therefore use this min function to ensure that the inner loop does not overshoot the end of the trajectory. These two lines here get a three times the number of atoms long vector that contains the velocities of all the atoms for the two trajectory frames of interest. We can get the velocities from the ASE atoms object that is stored for each trajectory frame by using the get velocities method. This method returns an n atoms by 3 numpy array, however. To convert this 2D array to a 1D array, a vector, we can use the method flatten, as I have done here. We then calculate the dot product of our two vectors of velocities here and add it to the variable ACF, which will ultimately contain the autocorrelation function. As you can see, when we finalize the calculation of the autocorrelation function here, the numpy array called ACF is used to hold the numerator for the average autocorrelation function. In other words, this variable holds the sum of all the dot products. The variable norm, by contrast, is used to hold the denominator. Uh, that is the number of estimates of the dot product that we are going to use to calculate the average. And that is pretty much all there is to this code for calculating the autocorrelation function. Let's finish by looking at what these autocorrelation functions look like in practice and thinking about how we can interpret what they tell us. On the left, 
side of this panel, you will see the autocorrelation function for a solid material. In a solid, you would expect the atoms to vibrate around their lattice sites. In other words, you would expect motion like that shown for the blue atom in the cartoon that I've drawn here. The autocorrelation function illustrates that this is indeed what you are seeing. You can see that there are these periodic oscillations in the autocorrelation function that suggest that the velocities continue to point in the same or the opposite direction for substantial periods of time after the initial time that we looked at the thing. By contrast, the autocorrelation function for the liquid looks like this. The correlations between the directions of the velocities at different times almost immediately go to zero. In our cartoon, we are thus seeing atoms constantly change direction like this and little to no correlated motion over long timescales. And that is pretty much all you need to know about this sort of analysis in order to attempt the exercises and early parts of the assignment. I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for your attention and good luck with the next steps.